make something, you heat that steel up first, right? And then you put it on the anvil, and what do you have in your other hand? Hammer. And you start beating on that hot metal until you make it what you want it to be. A horseshoe, a sword, a plowshare, a goad. Uh, the Word of God is like fire and hammer to us. How many of you have been hammered lately? All right. Let the Word of God heat you up. Let God take that hammer and knock you around a couple of times and you'll become what He wants you to be. Amen? How many of you need to be knocked around a little bit? All right, okay, in good company today. In James chapter 1, it's a mirror. And when you and I look in the Word of God, we see ourselves reflected. Sometimes we don't like what we see. That means that we're supposed to change. Go over to the, hand, the, the uh, anvil then and let the fire and the hammer reshape you. Matthew chapter 13, it's the seed. When you read the Word of God, it's like a seed. It's not finished yet. It's growing in you. And it comes to fruition. In Psalm 119, it's a lamp unto my feet. It's honey. It's sweeter than honey. Uh, it's gold. No, it's more precious than gold. In Hebrews chapter 6, it's an anchor. It'll keep us tied down in the storms. Multiple times. Too many to reference. The Word of God is referred to as testimony. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul refers to it as the books. He was in jail at that time and he was sending somebody to get some of his possessions. And he said, oh please... Don't forget the books. The books. But also the scripture is referred to as scrolls in Isaiah 34. Jesus referred to it in Matthew 21 as the scripture. This is the word of God. And when we get here, we realize in verse 6, one more time, that eyewitnesses actually wrote these things down. The source being Jesus, the very word of God. In 1 John chapter 1, if you want to turn there, I've got it marked in my Bible. It's back about 20 pages in my Bible. 1 John chapter 1. Uh, listen to what John writes. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our very eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we, see that, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. That's what John said about being an eyewitness. Revelation 22 verse 8 here. Uh, John chapter 1 and verse 7. Verse 14. Verse 15. Luke began to write the Gospel of Luke inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he says, there are many eyewitnesses among us and I want to tell you what they saw and what they did. In Acts chapter 2, he continues that. It's like a two-volume set. He was directing it to his friend Theophilus. Uh, marvelous. But they were eyewitnesses. In 1 John chapter 5, we have more witnesses than just the eyewitnesses. In 1 John chapter 5, John says this, there are three witnesses beside these numerous ones. The witness of the Father, the witness of the Word, the witness of the Holy Spirit. Folks, we have a marvelous inspired Word of God. And thirdly, I want to say this, that it is faithful and it is true. And some skeptics might look at this verse and say, wait a minute, how can a book be faithful to you? How can it be faithful uh, this week I checked out a book from the library on my Kindle. It's an e-book. Somebody say that you're impressed that the pastor knows this stuff. All right? Of course, I had to go down to the library and get them to load it onto my Kindle. All right? Uh, listen, I read that book. I'm going to read it a second time before I return the e-book 
oh my goodness, where are we at in this world? But you know what? I'm not so sure that book is faithful to me. Uh, you might be reading some books. You might be reading a love story. All right, uh, you, you might be doing that. But listen, I dare you to say that a book that you're reading is faithful to you besides this book. May I say this, and I want to say this with all of that I can uh, uh, muster up right now. This book has always stuck close to me ever since I met it. My grandma would swing on the swing, and I would see Grandma Owens uh, swinging on the swing and stirring up dinner and reading her Bible at the same time. And as a little child, I watched Grandma Owens. She never preached at me. She never beat me over the head with the Bible. But by her silent witness of having that Bible open, I said to myself, there's the answer. There's the answer. It is faithful. It is faithful to us. Hebrews chapter 4 calls it living, and it surely is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we read this. All the promises of God are made yes in Christ Jesus. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. John chapter 4, Jesus is the truth. John chapter 8, Jesus said, The truth shall set you free. You see, God's word will stand even through the storms. Amen, folks? And by the way, you read the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah pokes fun at people who worship a piece of stone or metal or wood. Uh, that image, that idol doesn't walk around. It doesn't escort you anywhere. Uh, it doesn't have your backside. It doesn't speak to you. It can't hear you. It can't supply you your needs. As a matter of fact, Isaiah even said they take a string. And when they build that idol, they, they tie it to the wall so it won't fall over. Could you imagine us having to do that for our God? To tie him up so he wouldn't fall over? Guys, we have a God who listens to us and speaks to us. And when he talks, he is faithful and true. Amen? The fourth thing I'd like to say about this is, as I gave you all those little cutting knives, uh, and I see that none of you are playing with yours. John, you're not playing with yours, are you? Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> but listen, the Word of God is compared to as a two-edged sword. And I want to focus on that just for a moment. These edges of this book are always sharp. Uh, we may lose the grip on it. You and I might drop our Bibles. We may not have it in our hands. We might walk away from it, but it makes it nonetheless sharp. Amen? We might let go of it, but it does not let go of us. Now, I noticed something. I've got one of these in my tool kit, and I've noticed that it's pretty dull, and it's starting to get rusty in there. Now, there are two things that will dull the edge of a knife, and that is misuse. Sometimes I'd be cutting on something, and all of a sudden I cut into a nail. Well, I don't cut nails. All right? You're going to have to buy something for yourselves, men. They'll cut nails. Or if I leave it in my toolbox out in my garage, and it's too long since I've last used it, it'll start getting rusty, won't it? You see, the Word of God can lose its edge in your life if you misuse the Word or if you don't use it at all. The Word of God maintains its edge. Uh, not long ago, I was under the knife. And the surgeon went to give me the shots of Novocaine and he took a little cancer out. And uh, I had offered him my pocket knife on the first visit. I said, look, Doc, it's right there. You know what you're doing. Here. And I pulled my pocket knife out and said, go ahead and do it today. No, nah, insurance don't work that way. Don't you love the word insurance? All right. The other day then, I went back to his office, and he shot me with a little Novocaine, and uh, he started getting the scalpel out. And I started telling him exactly what to do to me. I instructed that surgeon how to do it. Now, do you believe that? No. Oh, yeah, Michael back there says yes. Now, he knows what he's doing. 
He knows how to use that scalpel. The author of this book knows how to use this in your life. Please, gentlemen, don't get in charge. Let him be the surgeon. Let him do the work on your life. Don't advise him. Who was this addressed to? In 1 John chapter 5, to you who believe that you may know. To you who believe that you may know. That's why the Bible was written. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to put some gas in your tank. And here it is. I want to say something and maybe you'll get mad at me, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm becoming of an opinion that there is a difference between a Christian and a disciple. And that's why I'm spending Wednesday nights on the study of making and becoming disciples. We can become Christians by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, that does not make you a disciple. Now, come Wednesday night and argue with me if you want. All right? But I'm going to say something now. The Bible was written to you who believe, comma, that you may know. You see, there's a growing that a Christian makes, and it's through the Word of God. And we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we walk with Him, we follow Him, we carry our cross, and we become disciples. A second group that 1 John chapter 5 mentions is the little children. I was a little child in my faith. Sometimes when I talk to my Heavenly Father, I announce to Him, Lord, this is just one of your children coming into your presence I need some advice. I need direction. I need help. Uh, The Bible was written for us little children. But look at this. 1 John chapter 5 says it was written for you fathers. It was written for you young men. And all of these so that we might overcome our opponent. And then another group. To everyone coming into the world. John chapter 1. That they might see the light. Amos chapter 8 says this. That there will be a famine for the hearing of God's Word someday. A famine for the hearing of God's Word. And I think that we might be in that era today. You believe that? A famine for the hearing of God's Word. People shut their ears to it. A sixth thing in my outline I'd like to say is this. What are we supposed to do with God's Word? Where there's some do's and there's some don'ts. In Jeremiah chapter 36, there was a king in Israel. His name was Jehoiakim. And when he heard Jeremiah's prophecy being read off of a scroll, he would take a knife and cut the pages off that scroll and throw them into a fire. Whew! I'm sorry, but I think there's a special place for people like that. Amen? But there are four things I believe that we don't do with the Word of God. And the first thing is, we worship its author, but we don't worship its messenger. When John had this revelation given to him in verse 8, when he saw and he heard these things, he fell down and worshipped at the feet of the angel. The angel said, no, 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 don't do that. You worship God. I'm a fellow servant of yours. And so we're not to worship angels or pray to saints. Unfortunately, some people want to worship the preacher, and the preacher will say or do something someday that will disappoint you. I promise you that'll happen, right? All right? No, no, no. We don't worship the preacher. We worship our God. We worship Jesus, His Son, and we worship the Spirit who fills us. But we don't worship the messenger. Secondly, we don't seal it up. Uh, John here in verse 10 was told, don't seal this book up, don't close it up. Why? It's because it's now. It's coming true. And people need to know what's in the Word of God before it's eternally too late. Don't close it up. Don't keep it to yourself. Share it. And share it often. A third thing. Don't add to it. Jump over here to verse 18. Don't add to to God's Word. And verse 19, don't take away from it. God's Word needs no additives. It stands on its own. And may I say this, if you add anything to this word, you've got nothing. Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything away from it. Believe it for what it says.